Okay, we are back. I'm very happy to have back on the Goldstein on Gelt show Professor Angus Deaton, who is not only a repeat guest to the show, but he is the 2015 Nobel Prize winner in economics. Angus, a real pleasure to have you back. Thank you very much. It's nice to be back. So I've got a number of questions from you, but the first one that's kind of top on my mind is, what happened one morning very recently when your phone rang, and what did that conversation look like? Um, well, it's very early in the morning, and um, since you don't get a lot of phone calls anymore, and they're <laughs> usually robocalls, but you don't get a lot of robocalls at 6, 10 in the morning. So I had a pretty good idea of what it might be. Um, and there was this very sweet Swedish voice saying, you know, we have a very important phone call for Professor <laughs> Angus Deaton from Stockholm. <laughs> and so I knew we were about to step on the merry-go-round, <laughs> which in fact was the case. But it was very nice, and they read a sort of um, a, a short version of the citation. You know, not the 35-page version, <laughs> but the, uh, a very short version. And I realized that, you know, I'd always thought that um, I would probably not get it because I tend to work on a lot of different things. And as my wife, Anne Case, likes to say, you're fickle. You know, you don't stick to things. And they like to give the price for some big single thing rather than for. But they would found a sort of single theme through what I did. And I sort of thought, oh, that's what my life was about. I mean, so that, that was actually very nice, and it's been very nice since. So how did you know that this itself was not a prank call? I understand that's uh, something that happens around the Nobel season. I guess so. Um, I, never, I never thought it was a prank call until my friend Torsten Person, who's on the committee, said to me, Angus, this is not a prank. <laughs> <laughs> I thought, oh, my God, perhaps it is a prank. But, of course, it's just Torsten playing with my head. So I never seriously thought it was a prank. All right. Well, congratulations on that. I'm pretty sure that uh, that because you were previously a guest on the show, that really helped to uh, bring sure you across did. the line. Because just like Robert Schiller, who had previously been a guest before he got his prize, I believe that is one of the criteria that they uh, that they do look at there. Now, your prize uh, in in specific was related to an analysis of consumption and poverty and welfare, and I, I know that a lot of times people talk about abject poverty, but I'd like to talk about one step above that, meaning not, let's exclude from our discussion the people who literally have to spend all day getting water. Not that it's not an important topic, but yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I'd like to look at the concept of, of helping people in a society like the United States who are poor in order to bring them up uh, to the next level. And I think there's usually a pretty big debate, which is, you know, do you throw money at the problem or do you try to help them help themselves? And the problem often seems that uh, what the, the cycle continues because whatever programs the government comes up with don't really seem to help people to break out and to move up a level. Is there a, a real solution that we should be looking at? Well, I mean, I think um, for one thing in the United States, if, if we're focusing on that, the safety net here is, you know, way, way um, – less well-developed <laughs> than is the case in most rich countries in the world. So I find it somewhat implausible to take the idea that we're doing too little uh, here. It's true that Americans have this enormous mistrust um, of government, which sometimes is more or less self-fulfilling, which would be a pity. Um, it's also true that, um, you know, we have bad data as far as poverty measures in the United States are concerned. So we're using a measure that was set up in 1963 and for a bunch of, you know, more or less accidental conditions, reasons, it's never been properly revised. And so, you know, a, a statement that's often made on the right is we've spent all this amount of money on the war on poverty and the numbers are exactly the same as they used to be is really not true. Um, let's, let's help me out with that because you're saying the definition we're using for poverty is uh, from the 1960s. What is a reasonable definition to say that people are really poor? No, but these are, I mean, I'm, I'm less concerned with that, which is a very hard question than just if you have programs to help the poor, you should actually count them in deciding whether someone's poor or not. And we don't even do that. Uh -huh. So, you know, we give people like the earned income tax credit so they get money back on their taxes, but we don't count that in the poverty measure. So you could eliminate poverty 
by giving people money. I'm not saying you could, but if you were to do that, it still wouldn't show up in the statistic. So there's just a very elementary thing that we're doing is just wrong. I mean, when this was set in 1960, the poor didn't pay any taxes, so they just forgot about taxes and they never put it in there. And that should have been fixed along the way. And for a whole bunch of reasons, it's been very difficult to do that. Yeah. Can you explain this to me a little bit further? I, I'm trying to f understand when you're saying that we're not including the fact that the poor are, are, are not or were not paying taxes and therefore they're not really properly being counted. What would be the way we would count them? No, I mean, what we do is we're giving people money through the earned income tax credit or through food stamps, which is now called SNAP. Right. So when you count whether they're poor or not, you should include that in the amount they have. All right. We're not even doing that. Everybody agrees that that would be a good thing to do. I don't think anyone on right or left um, argues that you shouldn't count the incomes that people have when you count whether they're poor or not. I mean, this is just like an error. Um, this is not a political dispute. But that doesn't stop people on the right sort of using the unadjusted figures to say that um, you know, the war on poverty has been a failure. Because those are the statistics that are available, so they're using what they've got instead of... Well, it's not just they're available. The, the White House would actually have to issue, um, you know, a set of rules which says you have to count this difficult differently, and that would have to go through Congress, and then it would all hell would break loose. And no president has been prepared to use political capital to make that happen. I see. We're talking with Angus Deaton, the 2015 Nobel Prize winner in economics, uh, talking about hell breaking loose. Uh, which we'll try to contain a little bit here. One of the proposals that a lot of people have said in helping the poor, who those people especially who are against too many government programs, is what a lot of poor people need is just cash, and then they can figure out what, what they should do with it because you know, they're grown-ups and they don't have to be told where to spend their money, and hopefully they'll, they'll have the opportunity to push, pull themselves up by the bootstraps. Is that a reasonable model? Um, I think it's reasonable. There's a lot of dispute about whether it's correct. I mean, in the U.S., that's essentially what we do. I mean, food stamps are food stamps. They're not exactly cash, but they're pretty close to being cash. The earned income tax credit, for instance, is cash. I mean, so you're giving people cash. So the, the debate about giving people cash is much been more about poorer countries and whether instead of giving foreign aid in the form of health services or building roads or giving money to the government to build schools, um, we should be just giving people cash. And, um, you know, that's a very lively movement. A lot of people think there's a lot of evidence in favor of that. I'm much more skeptical than most of those people. But um, nevertheless, that is a lively debate. So with all of the technology and medicine industry that we've seen, there's been so much improvement in the world, and yet there continues to be so much poverty. How come we're not able to solve the problem? Well, there's a couple of reasons. I mean, I think one of the reasons you're looking at, I think politics is at the center of a lot of this, um, and that you know, most of the poor countries in the world don't have the capability to deliver the sort of services or to take advantage of that technology. So the lack of government capacity, I think, is tremendously important in a lot of those cases. So, for instance, you know, the, the question I ask myself and other people ought to ask themselves all the time is, you know, there are millions of children dying around the world every year from things that they would not have died from if they'd been born in Israel or they'd been born in the United States. Um, and so the question to that is why? And it's not because they're dying from exotic diseases like Ebola or Marburg virus or something. They're dying from measles or they're dying from respiratory infections or they're dying from the influenza or they're dying from things that people in rich countries just don't die from. And the question is why? And the answer, I think, is that the health services in those countries are so badly organized because the state just does not have the capacity or perhaps even the interest in delivering that sort of health care. Well, it seems that the way that a lot of people are trying to solve that, like the Bill Gates Foundation, is by throwing huge amounts of money at it, which to some extent, I mean, I think that the Gates Foundation has been very successful on the one hand. On the other hand, we actually recently had on the show here Peter, Diamand P Peter Diamandis, who set up the X Prize and is a very big fan of incentive prizes because it brings a lot more people. You know, one $10 million prize can bring a lot more investment in a, in a question because lots of teams will be after it, and yet we don't really see that happening so much in healthcare. Is there a reason that you think incentive prizes might not work to solve some of the problems that you're describing? Yeah, well, there are strengths and weaknesses with incentive 
um, prizes too. Um, you'd better specify the right thing. I mean, a lot of the greatest discoveries of mankind have been people finding things they weren't looking for. I mean, think of penicillin, for example, and you can't do an incentive prize for something like that. But I think incentive prizes certainly have that have their strengths. And some of them have worked. I mean, there's a vaccine for municocal, whatever it's called, that did not use it there and has saved quite a lot of lives. So, I mean, I think they certainly have a place. It's not always easy to get a government to agree to them and to credibly pay up um, when, you know, when they um, someone actually makes the discovery. Um, the famous story of longitude, you know, and the guy who invented the clock that solved the longitude problem, he never got his prize because they were disputing about it forever afterwards. So it's actually often very hard to know whether people have met the technical conditions for the prize or not. But I'm, I'm very much in favor of that um, as part of the mix. Uh, uh -huh. I think there's a lot of really good research, and I think we can do. But coming back to Gates, I mean, I, I think throwing large sums of money into African countries, I mean, there's a first round of fact, which is if you put people on antiretroviral therapy, for instance, and they're alive and without otherwise have been dead, you know, that's a huge moral gain, and no one should gain say that at all. But on the other hand, you know, in the long run, you're only going to solve these problems of kids dying from these diseases if governments and people take their own responsibility for building a healthcare system. And I don't think you could do that from the outside. Right. I, I think exactly what you're describing is that it's a real political problem. And by having people 10 and 15,000 miles away tell you how to solve the problem is just not going to happen. And we see it not only with, with, the, with disease, but you even see when countries go into other countries and try and say, we're going to give you democracy and this is the way to do it. And we're going to kill you till you accept it. It doesn't always work. It's, it's, well, it almost never works. And, yeah. <laughs> you know, the feedbacks are wrong apart from anything else. I mean, you know, the citizens of Sweden or of Britain might be very well-meaning, but they've got no way of monitoring what's happening to that money and whether it's doing good or harm. And it's certainly making them feel good. Sometimes <laughs> I'm afraid that that's all that really seems to matter. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think my feeling on this has often been when I talk to people about charity, nothing, well, not that I actually do have certain things against the big charities, but I, I often tell people, focus locally and focus on charities that you can personally be involved in so you see where your money goes and exactly how, you know, whether you're going to give $1,000 or $100 million, you see what it's doing and make sure that it actually happens because otherwise, you know, big charities are like big politics and it all ends up kind of getting lost in the mix and not necessarily helping the, the poor person at the end who you really want to help. Well, if you're doing it locally, there's a feedback so you can see whether what you're doing is some good. And if it goes wrong, you can stop. Whereas if it goes horribly wrong in the Central African Republic, you have no way of ever knowing it and you can't see what's happening. And besides, you probably don't understand how the world works there anyway. So your chances of doing good are more hit or miss. Yeah. Real problem. One of the other problems we have, of course, is that we are just about out of time. But in the last, in the last minute, just tell me, what are you working on these days that is going to... Well, uh, I, I've been working with Anne Case on a paper that got a huge amount of attention the other day on how white middle-aged people in the United States are dying and the mortality rate has actually gone up. So after the best part of a century of mortality decline, that's actually gone up over the last 10 or 12 years. And a lot of that's coming from drug addiction, um, it's coming from alcohol abuse, and it's coming from suicides. So, and it's much more heavily focused in working class people. So there's a sense in which this, you know, working class whites society in America is sort of disintegrating to the point of death. Uh, so that's well, a big issue that we're working on right now. All right, we will keep an eye on that. I guess I'm glad as a white middle-aged American that I've moved to Israel because I'm hoping that doesn't affect me here. It doesn't happen in Israel. Yeah. Thank God. All right. So, and now in the last few seconds, just tell us how can people follow you, follow your work, and get a copy of your book? Well, my book, The Great Escape, is available on Amazon and other good bookstores. There's a lot of material on my website, so if you're interested in me, there's a very short autobiography called Puzzles and Paradoxes, The Life in Applied Economics, um, which a lot of people seem to enjoy. I write a regular um, letter for the Royal Economic Society website, and those are all on my website, too. So there's a lot of reading there if people want to catch up. Okay, and we will put a link to that at the show notes of today's show at goldsteinongelt.com. Professor Angus Deaton, thanks so much for your time. Thanks for talking to me. I enjoyed it. <laughs>
You are listening to the Goldstein on Gelt Show with money maven Doug Goldstein. Doug's weekly radio show is heard around the world, but if you miss it, you can download the podcast at www.goldsteinongelt.com. The Goldstein on Gelt Show gives you up-to-date financial ideas so you can get on the path to financial freedom. If you'd like your questions answered on the air or off, send Doug an email to doug at profile-financial.com. It's your money for your future, so join Doug every week to build your wealth on the Goldstein on Gelt Show. 